Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Arts Shaping Equality, Parting the Future session. Uh, I have with me today a very distinguished artists, Carol Furman, Helen Frederick, Linda Stein, Wendy Arten, and Aiden Sova. For centuries, gender influenced the production and reception of the arts. Uh, as female artists were forbidden to have an equal education, um, access to equal education and develop an artistic language. To achieve gender equality, how can female artists confront and change the narrative? And how do you promote equality in everyday life? That is the question we are going to tackle today, at least try to tackle today. Uh, I am uh, Filiz Cicek, I will start with myself. I was born in the Turkish-Georgian border so I have one foot in the Caucasus region, another foot in the, the Middle East. Uh, I had influence from both Christian, Soviet era culture and also Middle East and the Islamic culture. And after coming to US to study through Europe, I became very keen on uh, looking into the artistic expression of the refugees, immigrants, and people on exile, whether by choice or by force. So I consider myself a bit of a nomadic artist, or uh, I like to call, my, call myself a postmodern nomad, I should say. So, um, so I'm going to uh, show a couple of my pieces. just by putting the uh, cursor there. Now, in addition to the immigrant and the exilic people's experiences, uh, I'm also interested in religion. Uh, after 2003, when P President Erdogan's uh, children came to study in Indiana, I became very keenly aware of how religion affects women's lives because I was pressured by them to join the religious political organizations. And I didn't understand why I should have to do that. I said no, and so I was targeted. So I went into this journey of understanding why. Why can't I just go to my um, studio and uh, make art? And, and you know, they, they go to my, they do their thing, I do my thing. And it turns out that life isn't that simple. Being yourself and doing what you want to do isn't that simple. Uh, luckily, I was able to study with Judith Chicago and I had a few other mentors where I realized the importance of being yourself um, is a very simple, but at the same time, very politically charged situation. But it's a very important one that we as a woman, everyone, but we as a woman must embrace and fight for because regardless of the race and gender um, and country, I should say ethnicity and country, uh, women are often at the bottom of the totem pole and they're often told to wait uh, that there are other issues to solve before their problems uh, can get attention. So I believe in here and now solving problems that women face because the, we face these problems, we die in wars, you know, we are raped every day here and now. So. Uh, if there are racial uh, inequalities, I think we should um, tackle them together with the uh, gender inequalities. And um, since I said one, my foot is in Caucasus, I am keeping an eye and ear uh, in what's happening in Ukraine very keenly because it's very close to uh, where my mom lives. And um, this is also reminding me what uh, happened a few years ago, uh, I'm gonna go back to a different slide now, with Pussy Riot, for example. So this is Pussy Riot uh, in Moscow in a church when they went in and did a punk rock song appealing to Mother Mary to stop Putin. Of course, um, they were uh, arrested and put in jail and they were in Glock for um, five years, maybe even longer than that. Uh, 
and they were only let out during the Sochi uh, Olympics because it looked bad for Putin and Russia. Um, now, obviously, um, I'm not promoting that uh, every woman artist should do that. It's just that uh, I'm recognizing we all respond differently to life around us um, based on what's happening. Some of us record what's happening. Some of us respond to what's happening. Some of us always wants to celebrate life by you know, um, painting flowers, which are all very valid and important. And I have today with me such artists who are responding to life, uh, to their community and to the events, what's uh, events that are happening in the world today. Uh, our first artist is Linda Stein. Um, I'm going to introduce her uh, next. She was born in 1943 uh, in the U.S., lives and works in Manhattan, New York. Uh, and she is the founding president of the nonprofit organization called Have Art Will Travel uh, for courageous kindness, uh, addressing bullying and diversity. Have Art Will Travel currently have two traveling exhibitions with educational workshops called The Fluidity of Gender and Holocaust Heroes, Fierce Females. Other exhibitions for travel include Displacements from Home, Sexism, and Masculinities, Femininities. Recently, her schedule includes solo exhibitions at Kent State University in Ohio, uh, United States, the Wagner College Holocaust Center in New York, Victoria Gallery and Museum Liverpool, England, and Kunstmuseet Skövde in Sweden. In 2018, Stein was honored as one of 21 leaders for the 21st century by Women's E-News. Stein's art archives are at Smith College and at the Linda Stein Art Education Collection is housed at Penn State University. In 2020, Penn State endowed in perpetuity an annual Linda Stein Upstander Award for scholars using Stein's archives to inspire the bullied, bullies and the bystanders to become brave upstanders for justice. Welcome, Linda Stein. Thank you so much, Felice. You've been terrific. I'll focus today on one series from my work going back to the 1960s and 70s called the Profile Series to address growing up mid-century and to show how gender and sexuality sparked my feminism and my activism. More than 25 museums are now acquiring this work for their permanent collections. And there'll be a major retrospective at the Hovde Museum, which you mentioned in Sweden in 2023, as well as solo shows in the UK and US. I was this little ball playing kid who beat all the girls and most of the boys in the popular games of the day. I idolized my decade older sister, a professional model, as you could see, my own role model, who was as sexy and every bit as beautiful, I thought, as Marilyn Monroe, who was flaunted everywhere as the ideal female, the role model for what every girl and woman should want to be. This femininity culture was the backdrop and resource material, if you will, for my life's journey starting in an era when the label boy crazy would suit me just fine. You might imagine that with this background, it came as a real surprise to me when I first found myself in bed with a woman. We had sex before I knew what the terms meant. We didn't think what we were doing in bed was homo. I was just so naive in those days and the words lesbian and gay were hardly mentioned. So fast forward with me, if you will, to when I finally comprehended, duh, that what we were doing was indeed homosexual, a word I knew only to be uttered in deep derision and with much stigma. My shame then was visceral and intense. I began recording my feelings with sketches in a diary. I wrote, I must tell no one. I must hide it from every living person I know. 
I'm totally despicable. Some of these faces I'm drawing look back at me with disdain, even disgust. I have to make sure they can't see me. But no, that's not enough. I don't want even the potential of being seen. I have to leave the eyes out altogether, I wrote. I must begin just below the eyes. Was I averting the gaze, as we say in today's Leo? The gaze of my own drawings and paintings staring critically back at me? I had to be sure that none of these faces had the means to see me. This me that was so very bad. I sketched and made notes to myself in these diaries until my profiles morphed into what was an idealized form for me, one that I felt had a certain presence and power, a large, strong, abstracted nose with absolutely the perfect arc and angle, merging just so with soft, sensual lips, curvilinear chin, strapping neck, and what became an expansive landscape for the shoulder which sometimes continued onto a totally abstract canvas, the second part of a diptych. Each of the diaries detailed the pain I felt as I struggled with my sexuality, the ups and downs of my life and evolving womanhood. It showed that what I, I was a budding feminist, an activist with a longing to write and record my journey to let it all hang out on the page in order to relieve my stress. And indeed, it did have the effect of calming my nerves, easing my depression, and helping me feel less lonely and hopeless. My profiles came in series. They're easy to follow on my website, with titles that included identifiers such as the Profile Sketch Series, Profile Solid Series, Profile Writing, Marbleized, fringed, compartmentalized, notation, letter, palette, daubed, landscape, the profile flying series, the envelope series, until the sculptor in me took over and I began to incorporate Carl found on the beach with profile writing and alphabet letters. Soon bent nails and found objects were replacing profile parts. And gradually my work evolved into other series, stories, and projects. I created the nonprofit Have What Will Travel, which expanded the existing cultural narrative to highlight gender equality while enriching its educational programs with upstander behavior and, of course, outrageous kindness. These are the series, stories, and projects will remain for another time and another discussion in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. That's amazing. There's so much to learn and discover for me, uh, I'm sure, as for others in your work. Um, moving on, we are, um, I am uh, now um, honored to present Carol Fearman, who is an American sculptor and author. She is one of the three founding members of the hyperrealist movement that began in the late 1970s. She's the only woman to sculpt in this style. Her career is highlighted by figurative works of swimmers and dancers. She has been included in exhibitions at the Smithsonian Institution's National Portrait Gallery, the State Hermitage, the Venice Biennale, Palazzo Strozzi, Palazzo Real, and Gallery de Art Moderna, among others. Fierman received the Charles D. Murphy Sculpture Award in 1981. In 1982, she received the Amelia Peabody Award. And in 2016, she received Best in Show Awards from Huan Tai Museum. There are four full color monographs about her work, and in 2021, she published her autobiography. She has taught, lectured, and given workshops at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Solomon Guggenheim Museum. In 2011, she founded the Carol Feuerman Sculpture Foundation. Her artworks are owned by 18 museums, as well as in the collections of the city of Peaks, 
Catskill, New York, the city of Sunnyvale, California, President and Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton, the Frederick Wiseman Arts Foundation, Henry Kissinger, Stephen Cohen, and the Malcolm Forbes Magazine Collections. She lives and works in New York City. She's married and has three children and four grandchildren. Welcome, Carol. Hi. So I started working professionally in 1967 when I graduated college. And I was discouraged by everyone from being an artist, my parents, my husband, my teachers, galleries and museums. But being the type of person that I am, I wasn't gonna listen. I, I don't listen. I was determined to follow my dream. So I began looking for a gallery to sell my art. And that's when I hit a wall. There were very few artists showing in New York galleries and less than 4% of artists showing at the Met or major museums. Only a few of them even had a solo show, but in spite of that, 76% of the nudes hanging in the museums were painted by men and they were nude women. So work by women artists made up only 5% of major collections in the US and Europe. Uh, very discouraging, very upsetting for me. And I also became a feminist. Um, also, men were making more money. Similar works were selling for two or three times more and they sold better. Um, I went to a show at the Met and this was about five years ago. So it wasn't even so long ago. And um, I noticed that it was a final year show, a figurative show on the, the body. It's called Life, Sculpture, Color, and the Body. And I wasn't even asked to be in that exhibition. Um, and I, I love the work that was in it. I respect the 120 pieces that were included. But there were only three or four women's works included in, out of 120. So I asked myself, sad, huh? Why? Why are men's voices dominating the art industry? And women artists are written out of history. What's going on? And what can we do about this? And I thought about this, and I've been thinking about it for a while. Um, so first, I think to a, accomplish gender equality, we must support other women. We have to create our own uh, network of women, women artists, women in business, leaders, um, our own mailing list and befriend other women and even women who struggle. That's why I formed my foundation. Um, I joined and I was invited to join the International Women's Forum. Uh, the, the lady, Carolyn Goldsmith, who helped me do my first book, um, to, my first uh, coffee table book, was a member. And I really, really wanted to be a member of this organization that um, the women who were members were too busy to, to join a club and you had to be invited by 10 members. So um, the forum is, it connects leaders across every professional sector all across the world. And their mission is also to advance women's leadership and equality. Um, there are now 7,500 members worldwide in 33 countries. And they too want to break the glass ceiling and this foundation was started by Ellie Guggenheimer 40 years ago when women leaders had trouble getting ahead and they, were, they weren't treated equally. So you've all heard the expression, the good old boys club. So the IF, the International Women's Forum referred to as the IFW was born and we formed our own good old girls club. Um, it provided support and inspiration to women and, and not just women artists, but women worldwide. Another important thing we can do, other than um, starting our own network and support other women, is prioritize education. Education is a means to an end and necessary to advance to leadership positions. Aim high. Failure is our best teacher, so don't be afraid to fail and, preserve, and persevere. I did a sculpture called Perseverance. <laughs> Another thing we need to do is we need to learn how to speak. Speak through our art, if that's the way we speak best, if we can write, write. Um, but whatever we do, we have to share our experiences and our feelings and make our voices heard. Um, 
also we have to learn how to speak to other people and be aware of the psychology of how we interact with people because we don't want to hurt people's feelings or feel superior because we're artists or whatever. So, um, you know, the psychology is that people like to interact with people who are like themselves. They like them better if they share common experiences and interests. So we should really learn how we're going to speak with people to get ahead. Um, and those, those, are, those are the things um, that I think are very important. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about my art. So I am, my most famous piece is called, um, is called The Survival of Serena. And I was moved by the immigrants I saw floating from Cuba into Key West when we had a timeshare in Key West. And I made my most iconic sculpture called Survival of Serena. Um, it's a woman, as you can see, resting peacefully on an inflatable tube. After enlarging it to monumental size, this serene and meditative sculpture was exhibited in the 2007 Venice Biennale in Italy. And that was a turning point. It was the first time I'd ever done monumental pieces. And um, many people thought that she was birthing uh, and all sorts of people related to her. They stood in line, they kissed her. Um, Italy renamed her Serenissima after the island of Venice. Um, and I am once again, after all these years, showing her this in this year's upcoming Venice Biennale, and she'll be on the Grand Canal for all of you who are going. In nine, in um, after 9-11, I had another turning point in my life. And I, I've been a figurative artist all my life, but I, I could not do the figure at that point. And I made my first sphere called um, Still Standing. And you can see from the fragmentation and empty areas, which represent bombing and violence. But in spite of that, I was trying to say that no matter what, we're still here. We're still one world. And we can, we can achieve, we can persevere. Another piece I did, and by the way, I'm not known for my spheres or the piece you're going to see now is um, it's called Seen But Not Heard. And years ago, um, people were told children are to be seen and not heard. And from my gender, my parents used to say that. But And then children all over the world are not seen. They're seen, but they're not heard. And I portrayed this, this little girl with her, her mouth taped as if bound shut. She has a bowl in front of her and no food. And you know, after all these years, from the time I made this piece till now, I don't see the situation getting that much better for, for children around the world. Um, this year, I'm do, I did a, an entirely new piece. It's huge. It's so huge, you can't fit on an airplane, and it cost a fortune to ship on a, on a, a, a boat, and hopefully it'll get there in time. But I called it Justice. And it's, it's the, a girl, she may be in a yoga position, but to me it's the scales of justice with both hands out. And she's shown in meditation, cross-legged on top of a huge polished stainless steel sphere. And um, anybody who looks at it will see themselves in the world reflected back in, in them. So symbolically, to me, it, it, it talks about justice and women, power, and, uh, and the world. Um, so what I, what I want to say, what comes out of this is that you should let your voices be heard. We're artists. We can speak through our art. Art is powerful. Our imagery is powerful. Um, whether it be on social media, in classrooms, or if we're lucky enough to be invited to speak in seminars such as this, we can affect change. We can affect change through our work, and we should, and we should try. And we don't have to do too much just a little bit. Every little bit helps. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Carol. Um, indeed, I think that every voice counts and um, one person can make a big difference as history shows. So uh, thank you. Next, I'm uh, happy to invite Wendy Orton. Uh, who is currently in Rome. So thank you for staying late and joining us, Wendy, first of all. 
and she's an American painter who divides her time between Italy, France, and America. She received an MFA in painting from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts of Boston and also BA from the University of Pennsylvania and studied for two years at the Ecole de Beau Arts in Paris, um, School of Fine Arts in French. Uh, her work is figurative and classical and explores the timeless interactions of light with surfaces such as the human figure, statues, still lives, and Roman ruins. Of art and figurative work, poet Jessica Fisher writes, the viewer is drawn into the process of making as she or he chooses where to read from, where negative space or desire completes the dance began by the brush and it's a liquid medium. Artin has been exhibited in Boston, Paris, New York, Ann Arbor, Milan, London, Rome, where she is an artistic advisor at the American Academy. Articles and Artin's work have been published in Le Art de la Coeur, American Artist Magazine, Artscope, uh, Pratique de Art, Arts Magazine, Art Magazine, Gourmet, Arts Media, Elle Decoration, Côte Sud, French Vogue, Joyce, Carnet, The Boston Globe, The New York Post, and The Vanity Fair. Her work, her work is in the collections of the Boston Museum uh, of Fine Arts, the Boston Public Library, and the Kelsey Museum, as well as many private collections. A film on Artin was featured in Bravo's Arts and Minds. Welcome, Wendy Artin. Thank you. Um, can you see my image? Can you see my image, please? I'm honored to have been invited to speak here to share my work and reflections on being a female artist in the year 2022. I've had a decades long career while also supporting a family and raising two beautiful children. And I can only hope to inspire and influence other women with my art, my story, and my female gaze. I grew up in a family where there was no difference between male and female in potential with equal honor and respect, and where I was surrounded by women, powerful, strong women, my mother, older sister, grandmother, aunt, and a tremendously supportive father. I climbed trees and rode in a unicycle, played music and put on song and dance shows in living rooms, and otherwise spent my childhood drawing. It's true that for centuries, women were not allowed to go to art school, but this is not my case. I was lucky enough to go to many art schools, and could never be where I am today without the years spent in those studios, with access to live models, to exciting and erratic student work, and the encouragement of my teachers at the museum school in the eighth of the Bazaar. It never even occurred to me that there might be a disadvantage to being a woman until I left art school and started to look for gallery representation for my drawings. I'm sorry, am I sharing my screen? No. I haven't been sharing the screen. I'm sorry, this is, that's the first slide and this is the second slide. Um, <clears throat> I was told two things. One could not have a show of only works on paper unless there was the justification of an oil painting for which there was a preparation. And simply to take a look at the names of the people represented by the prestigious gallery. Did I notice anything? I did not. They were all men. The gallery owners, too, were all men. The best galleries were owned by and represented only men. In fact, my art teachers were men, too. This is how it was then. Luckily, things have vastly improved thanks to the strong women who have fought for their place in the art world and the men who have backed them. But there's still leaps and bounds to be made. According to a recent ArtNet and Maastricht study, only 13.7% of living artists represented by galleries in Europe and North America are female. This is astonishing, art and design students are 70% female. In fact, one of my models here in Rome just told me that he had been posing for an American art abroad program and that 100% of the people drawing were women. I hope to be a source of inspiration for women who feel they might not manage to succeed 
succeed because of their gender and shine a light on the fact that there are improvements that need to be made. I'm tremendously grateful to the gallery owners and collectors whose support and enthusiasm for my work over the years has been fundamental for my artistic growth and allowed me to raise my children through making water colors. I try to keep the materials I use fresh, the marks active and varied. I love the way watercolor washes and spreads. The charcoal grate is the surface of the paper. The picture I make is somewhere between what the real thing looks like and what the materials look like, loose and precise. I often have to paint the same subject over and over until there's the right combination of freshness and detail. And then the sunlight moves, the shadows change, and there's a totally new image. Very early on in Rome, I started to organize small life drawing sessions in short poses. I wanted to create a comfortable situation for myself and for the models, for the models to be free to do the poses they wanted to do with good lighting, with music, so that they could enter into themselves, so that it was as much a beautiful personal experience for them as it was for me. I was the first person many of my models ever posed for. They came because they were actors trying to feel more comfortable with their bodies and performing nude on stage. One of them, Laura, came and was so happy with the experience that she sent me her friends, her boyfriends, returned again and again, and over the years has become a dear friend who still poses for me 20 years later. My models speak of how posing enriches their work as actors, how they can discover their femininity, how they can be whatever they want, from dainty to grotesque, from jackal or a Nike of Tamathrae, to ask an ad from a drill voice. I'm painting physicality through light and shadows and curves, reflections and shapes. The models are empowered not only by having been comfortably naked for hours in front of people, but also through seeing their bodies as art, as fluid marks, appreciated in a non-critical way, as an expressive ideal. Something I love about art is how varied it is and how there can be extremely powerful art with a political or social message an art that is equally as powerful with no message, that takes its power from beauty. Although a good deal can be said verbally about art, a great part of pictures is the entrance into a place that's simply visual, that everyone can share and feel and understand, whether capable of making it or not, or putting it into words. A little like the feeling you have when you listen to a piece of music, that wonderful transportation. I hope that my work can take the viewer into a place of visual fascination and pleasure, and that seeing a woman in a role where her art does not need to have a narrative might inspire of it. For me, and I think for many others, art is a refuge, a way to create something beautiful, to immerse oneself in a beautiful place, and to make life beautiful and better, and in one's own small reality, to make other people's lives better too. I'll finish off with a quote. The only excuse for making a useless thing is that one admires it intensely. Quote by Oscar Wilde, given to me by my daughter. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, art indeed is a refuge to us artists who are practicing. I'm sure that I don't have to explain, but I think uh, you're also making me think about how art saved our collective uh, sanity during the pandemic. Everyone turned to art. Um, so definitely, and I have friends who are um, expressing that, um, that that they are going to more art events uh, online and um, uh, they turn to art and nature more than ever. So thank you, Wendy. Um, so next, um, I'm going to introduce Eileen Soa from Toronto, Canada. She uh, identifies as a mixed race person with a white settler, Afro-Caribbean and black Seminole uh, ancestry. She is also an artist who lives with a disability. And such, she passionately identifies with the tenets of intersectional feminism and has dedicated her creative career to art and activism. Eileen's painting practice focuses on equity and diversity with a feminist focus on creating a dialogue around anti-oppression. She's also heavily involved in the areas of art advocacy, community activation, and promoting pluralism in the arts. Soa is the founder of the Feminist Art Conference and Blank Canvases, 
an in-school creative arts program for elementary school students. She holds an honors BFA from the University of Ottawa in painting, an MFA in painting and drawing from the University of Windsor. With extensive solo and group exhibitions in Canada and abroad, Sova's work has most notably been shown at the Museum of Canadian Contemporary Art, the Department of Canadian Heritage, and Mutuo Santo de Arte in Barcelona. Sova sits on the boards of Cultural Pluralism in the Arts, Ontario, and the Canadian Color Research Society of Canada. Welcome, Eileen. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Is everything good? You can see it before I start? Yes. Okay, great. So on March 15th, 2020, I was at my art studio when I heard that Canada was headed into pandemic lockdown. Not knowing what lockdown was going to look like, I frantically packed a huge bag of art supplies, imagining that I might not be able to return to my studio for several weeks. Three weeks into this pandemic, as many of you likely had, I felt a sense of loss and grief and needed to process what was happening in new ways. After several weeks of experimenting, risk-taking, the COVID collage project began to emerge from the materials I had scattered around everywhere in my new back office studio. I'm going to share some of these works with you and read through the artist statement that speaks to the visual vocabulary that emerged through this work. Our former eyes have been replaced and curtain pulled back on the inequities that we didn't quite fully see before. Rampant ableism, deep racism, vitriolic sexism, and complex classism. News and news feeds are full of surreal death stories and devastating condolences, read and consumed through these new eyes of truth, all laid bare by COVID-19. We look with different eyes that are metallic and shiny, eyes that haven't yet been formed, new eyes that no longer know how to look to our future for hope and possibilities, eyes swimming in pools of uncertainties brought by COVID-19. Our Instagram lives and our materialistic obsessions are now unimportant and breaking apart at the seams. Nails are unpainted, unkempt hair with new natural roots growing out of our scalps. Spring fashion lines are left on the rack, locked up in retail stores collecting dust. All were deemed unimportant by COVID-19. We are left to self-reflect, face ourselves, slow down, toss and turn at night with vivid crackling dreams, alive with messages screaming from our subconscious, a newly formed focus on symbols and images not yet fully understood, brought to you by COVID-19. Our connection to nature and the world around us is only now beginning to be understood. We thought we were separate, but now we know we are one. We were never the masters of this universe because nature was never ours to master. Fractured plants, roaming animals, the unpolluted sky, the contaminated dirt seeping in and out of our bodies. Sequestered in our homes, our minds begin to change, open up and fracture with confusion scattered with our former motivations that are no longer valuable. We float in a sea of unknowns, covering our faces with psychological and real masks. COVID-19 is a virus that makes reliability and safety unknown. In a sparkly, shiny, isolated dream space, how will we prophesize our new future and manifest in an uncertain one? Once I had about 20 of these works done, I began to think about how I could use them to create a public dialogue around food insecurity during the pandemic. And I was really thinking about the undocumented people in my neighborhood who might not be able to access government relief funding. So I partnered with a local food bank called The Stop, which is in my neighborhood of Parkdale in Toronto, Canada, and came up with the concept of collages for food. I posted the work to social media and invited people to exchange these collages for donations to local food banks and the messages began to flood in. 
People would send me the receipts for their donations, and then they would receive a collage in the mail. Through this social project, I was able to raise thousands of dollars for people dealing with food insecurity. And through this work, I suddenly felt a sense of purpose, hope, and calm that I was yearning for during the pandemic. That sense of action and purpose-led feeling led me to the idea that we could use our platform at the Feminist Art Collective in Toronto to give an opportunity to see how other feminist artists might be interpreting the pandemic. We had a global call for submissions and invited feminist artists of all disciplines to share with us work created that touched upon intersectional issues of where equity meets the pandemic. I'm going to share three of those works with you today that I found particularly inspiring and invite you to read more and see the rest of the show on our website, factToronto.org. After receiving 180 submissions from global artists, we narrowed it down to 10 works that we felt were really, really powerful. This piece by Michelle Hammer from Australia, There Is No Escape, is a pair of works dedicated to all the people with invisible disabilities, chronic health issues, who are being left out of the public health policies in response to the pandemic. Gabrielle Najem from Brazil, her work expresses how developed countries had to scramble for hospital supplies and had their supplies stolen on a global scale, leaving Latin America extremely vulnerable. Giuliella Cerulli from Italy made collages that speak to the breakdown of the heteronormative nuclear family during COVID and the increase of the dangers of domestic violence during the lockdown. When I reflect upon the theme of this conference and consider all of those exceptional panelists and keynote speakers here, I'm feeling very grateful to be able to bring an intersectional feminist view to these discussions through the power of art and how it could provide world leaders with a deep insight and action for these challenging times so that we can truly build back better. Thank you, Eileen. It's uh, wonderful to see um, an artist who is responding to what's happening immediately. It's uh, quite extraordinary. Thank you. Our last speaker today is Helen Frederick, who is an artist, educator, and curator. Uh, she lives and works in Silver Spring, Madison, where she directs Reading Road a Studio. Major exhibitions of Frederick's work have been held at the Eleanor D. Wilson Museum at Hollins University, Dudan Gallery in New York, um, Henny Onsted in Norway, and in Traveling Museum exhibitions in Japan, Scandinavia, Europe, Greece, the United States, and South America. In 2021, Terza Piano Gallery DC featured a mini retrospect and monograph about her work. A graduate of Rhode Island School of Design, she received the Southern Graphic Council International Printmaker Emeritus Award in recognition of her role as founder of Pyramid Atlantic Art Center and has received the College Art Association Distinguished Teacher Award. She is featured in the Feminist Art Base Brooklyn Museum of Art. Welcome, Helen. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to dedicate my talk, my presentation to the women of Ukraine who have taken their children over borders to be safe while their husbands and Fathers and brothers and friends are fighting for freedom. I want to talk today about witness activism, which I think addresses our question about how to achieve gender equality in community and collaboration. Can you see my images? Can you see my images? Yes. Okay, so uh, starting with the Living a Dark Night project that was uh, organized by Paula Sengupta in India to bring the reflection of the democratic voice of black and white printmaking uh, into contemporary thought. And Living a Dark Night is about how many people were lost to COVID in India and worldwide. My piece is called No More Shrouds, is reflective on that vast number of lives, how they are wrapped in waiting in hospital beds, homes, doorways, streets, 
and lovingly carried to beloved ones to a final fire and prayed over so the journey may continue into more blessed spheres. As a witness, my prayer is no more shrouds. I feel that women must tell their own stories to be empowered, as many of you have already said, like the Hindu goddess Kali, who is considered to be the master of death time and change in her fearlessness. We must be so also. The power of social media, such as this Adidas ad, exploits women in their bodies. And this image was produced as an advertisement for an undergarment. Current media-driven pervasiveness and rapid, ever-changing global dimensions provokes challenges in terms of how gender portrayal is given. So I think we need to be witnesses, and we are a global network of cultures in that way. Sometimes we wash our own faces with words or alter them somehow with water so they become more a language, as in the self-portrait washed on the left. Or we take a group and we put them uh, to a questionnaire. Uh, did it? Is it still there? Um, and create a community of witnesses that portray a new language. So I did a video installation with a video called Dissonance and a Witness Wall. That room was a community-based project. The portraits and Witness Wall represent almost 100 individuals who answered a questionnaire concerning planetary changes triggered by human activity. Presented to them in 2019 and 20, the questions related to the catastrophic damages and dangers that we are leaving to the planet as a result of individual and corporate materialism, societal injustices, and of course, nuclear threat, which has been a very big part of my concern. I was born two months before the first atomic bomb in Hiroshima. I moved between full-time studio practice and curatorial programming serving on boards through various projects such as Artworks for Freedom, an NGO that brings awareness to human trafficking. I hope to provide women often living in unbearable situations a supportive environment to successfully speak in full voices regardless of how their lives are interrupted and what borders they need to cross. And through the Delhi-based nonprofit, the Kala Chapa, that works in the areas of arts, culture, and environmental sustainability, I collaborate globally with artists and artisans for direct activism. In academia, I often do performances. These young women are handing something over in search of what is precious to them. On the right, this young girl is pushing away the atomic waste barrels. Where have our fallen gone? No matter who, no matter where, no matter how, installations feature in Women Now and Drawn Over exhibitions that we as falling are protected by our familia, cultural and ancestral images that are often printed on kites. And paradox, these diseased women who have masks and are fighting COVID still may be affronted with a tsunami wave. The hungry ghosts are also a very important subject to me because in Buddhist tradition in Asia and many parts of the world, they cannot transpire in, uh, in death and so they remain in, lim in a liminal space. And I think during COVID, we have many hungry ghosts where lives have been lost, the, the young girls who are lost, for example, uh, or interrupted, and many of us are in unsettled transitions. So the hungry ghosts have been a project from 2019 to 2021. The view of Daunting was done after 9-11. You see me looking back to these uh, two uh, towers with the American flag after we lost those uh, the, the litany of names in 2011, but 2001. But I, I believe that in walking in meditation, we can heal and we can change what's happening, both for women and in the world. So the question of preservation versus innovation seems to underlie much of our cultural discourse as if a choice between cultural and gender identity and a global homogeneity were possible I believe with voices of creative women in prominent positions worldwide, equitable advancements will be made. And archives are important in that way, the feminist art base of which several of us in this panel uh, are part of, uh, was created early on in the 2000s and is available for research and um, activity by artists that I'm honored to be part of in this archive. So I, I thank the wonderful panelists. I uh, invite you to go to my websites and I'm very, very pleased to have been part of this conference today. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Helen. And, and everyone, uh, we are a few minutes after our uh, allotted time, but we do have um, people um, who have been listening. So I want to turn immediately to them to see if anyone has a question. And feel free to um, uh, just grab the microphone, which is at the bottom of the screen. And also we can ask each other questions. Um, if you want to stay and talk uh, longer, please feel free to do that. Um, I myself have one question to Linda as she was speaking uh, about women supporting other women. I find this to be always very um, an interesting, uh, challenging and rewarding problem, <laughs> challenge maybe I should say, because when I came to US, I realized that how individualistically based this culture is, you're supposed to, you know, um, pick yourself up and um, do things on your own. And as further east you go, uh, there's more and more the culture gets collective or the individual gets um, dis uh, dissolved and it disappears where the fight in the Southeast Asia is to become an individual here is to create sisterhood or collectivism. So coming from Turkey right in the middle, I, I experience both. So uh, I'm wondering um, what are some of the uh, challenges and also accomplishments that you have thus far, Linda? Um, I think it's very important for women to support women. And I think that a lot of the time women step forward and are, their voices are drowned out by the men in the room. So if that probably still happens a little bit today, if you're sitting around a room and you maybe have six women in the meeting and a man walks into the room and sits down and is a seventh person, you know, the air kind of uh, goes out of the voices of the women and people turn to the man for his opinion. It's happening much less now, but we have to be very, very aware of this. We have to be sure that our eyes and our questions don't go to the men in the room or the world and focus on who is speaking regardless of gender. So I think that uh, it, it, it's just very, very important for us to help each other. And uh, I, I know that in Have Art Will Travel, we make a point of honoring upstander behavior. With, with our stipends that are awarded every year, but also in our performances and lectures. And we have local people, poets and uh, dancers do work that relates and addresses upstander behavior. And uh, Carol, you spoke directly about two. So uh, would you like to add to what Linda is uh, saying? I I think the artists that were chosen, the five of us, the, all six of us are just incredible. Mm -hmm. I'm just so excited that to get to know you. And Linda, if you want to be a member of the forum, you let me know. I'm on the committee. I would love to have you. Okay. I'd love I, to. Oh, my God, the work. It's so varied. I mean, I don't know who chose us, but did a great job. And I want to continue to know all of you. Ditto. <laughs> what I call is a rooster complex, as Linda described it really well. The people before <laughs> graduating, like uh, gravitating towards the men, like especially in the restaurant, that also happens and happens in, in a lot of places in our lives. Uh, but I want to turn it to other people, uh, the wonderful panelists. If you uh, want to ask each other questions, please feel free to do so. I am so sorry, but I have to go. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Wendy. Go go to sleep, I guess. It's late for you, so thank you for joining us. Thank oh, you, are you in Rome, Wendy? All of the world. <laughs> you, you live in Rome? Yes. Yeah, Am I going to see you 
Am I going to see any of you in Venice? You have my number. Oh, no, I won't have any in Venice. But, but I wish you all, all, all the best. It's wonderful work. All wonderful work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's Thank keep you. in touch, the six of us. Let's yeah, let's do it. Going forward. All right. Yeah, really. Bye. Thank you for sending everybody's email. <laughs> That was uh, Linda's idea. Apparently, she went to a session this morning, and um, so thank Great you, idea. Linda. You're my girl. <laughs> yeah. So I had about fifteen people tell me they would RSVP, and none of them showed up. <laughs> <laughs> I'd so like we- to do something from a session this morning. I think that uh, one thing in, during COVID that we discovered in, as women is the importance of turning off the network when we can. And I know we're all very busy and very dedicated. I've heard that in all your presentations, but I so valid right now that we take a day, maybe it's Friday or Saturday, and we don't have our cell phone on, we don't have the computer on, because (laughs) in that quiet space is when we really are inspired and aspirational and creative and can give to others. And if we just continue to be led by social media, and all the noise that's going on, uh, it puts us in danger to be able to go to go forward as powerful women. So I really want to think about that. A number of panelists in different ways were saying that uh, throughout the session, and I think it's valuable for us to consider. I uh, myself uh, ch- struggle with that, and finally this year I told my students that I will... Uh, only respond to emails between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. on weekdays, even though my school sends me alerts at like 12 midnight sometimes. <laughs> uh, so that is definitely a challenge, and I it's, it feels so much better. At first, I felt guilty on weekends not exactly. at emails, and I realized how much I have internalized the system. <laughs> so. Uh, how, how about the challenge of feeling that you're not doing enough? Is that a women-oriented feeling? or Do men feel that as much as women, I wonder? Yeah. I, I think, you know, there is this uh, tendency to, 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 to say, Linda, what's, what's the matter? Can't you do more? You, you know, uh, you feel the men don't, don't feel that as much. I don't know. I just feel that as I get older, I want to do so many things and that, you know, I can't cope with time. So I want to spend more and more hours. I want to do better art. I want to use every moment, make it count. I want to communicate. I am one who's addicted to social media. I feel that it's a very good uh, method of getting our word out. Um, The Women's Forum posted us on LinkedIn and our messages. So uh, that went out to thousands of women. And I think it's helpful for me to get, you know, and, you know, yes, I get messages from Europe early in the morning and I find myself waking up at 530 to see what everyone's saying. But, uh, you know, we live in, we live in this, this time. And uh, I know myself when, <laughs> when the pandemic started in India, I was working with a nonprofit, the College of Palm, we put out 15 newsletters. Uh, with news from all over the world. And I mean, it just killed us to keep up with that pace. But it's because, as you're saying, we knew it was significant to get the word out. And it is. Way. Yeah. This, this way, when a country like Russia does all the propaganda and, say, and says these horrible things, we still have, we have our connections and we can speak the truth. And unfortunately, and very, very sadly, um, and I'm sure you're realizing it too, how few people in this world have any good values. There's way more bad people than I thought, so. (laughs) Of course, I don't want to speak for